Hello and welcome to the second in our series of videos on the decipherment of Linear A. Here again we welcome forensic accountant and author Mark Cook. Hello Mark. Hi Jerry, thanks for having me again. The response to our first interview has been quite impressive. At the time of filming this, which is six weeks after posting our first, our first interview has been watched over 1200 times. You must be quite pleased. Yeah, I am. Um, I, I was, I was a bit worried that my book, when I published it, would be consigned to um, oblivion, or, or kind of like that bit in the film *The Mummy*, where the guy, the guy shouts out, "You, you know, you must not read from the book, otherwise the monster will be unleashed." Um, but, but since since we um, spoke last, a, a good academic review of the book has been published. Um, and matters have progressed towards publishing a second edition with um, a good academic publisher, um, and, and our first video generated a good level of interest. So, yeah, I, I am pleased. That sounds exciting. So what are we going to be discussing first today? Well, first I thought we'd recap. Um, let's go over dates again, which we looked at last time. The first example we looked at was this one. As we discussed last time, the hieroglyphs have been slightly modified. Horizontal lines are used to count units of 10 in the linear A corpus, and circles are used to count units of 100. So, with the linear A symbols used to represent the word fourth, the four dashes from the first hieroglyphs are put inside the circle of the last hieroglyph. As we will see, this is the same with third and second. For month, the arc of the hieroglyph is horizontally compressed so that it becomes something of an inverted V with curved arms. The point of this, if you recall, is, I think, so that it takes up less room horizontally. As we see with other linear A symbols, Next, we looked at this tablet. Here we have the same thing with the ordinal, if you recall, but the scribe has abbreviated a different form of the Middle Egyptian word for month, and the Greco-Roman method of shorthand that was used was one where a word could be abbreviated to the first, the last, or a distinctive letter from the middle of a word. And here, he's chosen to do the last of these. That's right, I remember. And next, let's look at one more. Here we see the same linear A symbol representing hieroglyph N11 used twice because the Middle Egyptian word for month was the same as the Middle Egyptian word for first. So we therefore have first month at the start of this tablet. Interesting stuff, Mark, and another example to demonstrate your case. And next, I think we're going to be discussing place names. That's right, place names. Um, now, we know uh, which place names were mentioned in the later Linear B corpus of tablets. Um, and, and we would expect, all things being equal, um, many of those place names to be mentioned in the earlier Linear A corpus of tablets, all things being equal. Um, now, we also know um, the Egyptian names of places in Crete. Um, and so given, given our theory, um, or given that we know um, that Linear A is Middle Egyptian written in shorthand using hieroglyphs, um, we, can, we can test that. We can test that by looking at what is written in Linear A. Are the place names that we would expect to appear actually those that, that do appear. That would be a good test of the theory. I think so. So um, one of the big breakthroughs when Linear B was translated was identifying certain place names. Um, and there were five principal Cretan place names that appeared in the Linear B corpus. Um, and they were, apologies for the pronunciation, um, Amnisos, Knossos, Phaistos, Lyktos, 
and Tylosos. Um, and we know the Egyptian names for the first four of these. Um, and actually, we see the first three of those, so Amnisos, Knossos, and Phaistos, in the Linear A corpus. First, we have Amnisos. Amnisos was the port of the Minoan capital, Knossos, and was the place name that Michael Ventris first noted in his decipherment of Linear B, helping him prove his theory of decipherment. As a place of evident significance, all things being equal, we would expect it to appear in the Linear A records. Its first hieroglyph is reversed, and in rather cursive form here, becomes Linear A symbol L97, and is used as the shorthand representation of the city's full name. Next we have Knossos. Adding further evidence, if that were needed, that Linear A is shorthand Middle Egyptian written in modified and simplified hieroglyphs, the most frequently appearing place name in the Linear A corpus is Knossos. That is understandable as Knossos was the capital of Minoan Crete, and while these tablets were written during and by the Egyptian administration, Knossos was a centre of great importance, including potentially having the largest population on the island. Linear A symbol L55 is simply a straightforward, simplified representation of its first two hieroglyphs and is used as the shorthand representation of the city's full name. The final place that is recorded is the town of Phaistos, which is a few miles from Hagia Triada, again, apologies for the pronunciation, where these tablets were found. So we would expect that to appear as well. As we've discussed, in ancient shorthand, symbols were rotated. Here the first hieroglyph of the place name was rotated by 180 degrees, and the foot depiction was turned into a simplified stick foot, which is used as the shorthand representation of the city's full name. This all paints the same picture, doesn't it? I think it does. Um, and if you can test your theory successfully across the whole corpus, um, then you know with a pretty high degree of certainty that you're, you're likely correct. Um, for Ventris with Linear B, it was easier. The Linear B symbols, um, once their individual sounds were identified, when that was applied across the whole corpus, as long as they always spelled Greek words, then he knew he was correct. Um, for us, dealing with shorthand, um, it's more difficult. The test has to come from more lateral thinking based on the context of Linear A. That's right. So now onto the numbers, I think. Yes, as a, as a fellow accountant, perhaps this will be the most interesting bit for you, Jerry. Um, and we, we've already talked about some of the numbers. So um, if you recall um, units of one, they are vertical tally marks. Units of 10 are horizontal tally marks, which we discussed in the context of dates. Um, and circles are units of 100, again, which we discussed in the context of, um, of dates. But it's with some of the fraction symbols that we can most clearly see the um, Egyptian connection. So here are four linear A fraction symbols. And I should say that we are only going to look at some fraction symbols, these four, because others, um, which have been perceived to be fraction symbols, are not actually fractions. Um, and we'll we're, we're come to that shortly. But these four, you can clearly see um, that they are derived in a very straightforward manner from Egyptian hieratic fraction symbols. Slightly rotated, in one case reversed, but the correlation between the two is evident. You say there are other symbols that are thought to be fractions, but which are not. 
That's right. Um, and there were also actually um, linear A fraction symbols that were created, I think, specifically for linear A because um, I, th I think it's where on a tablet there was a linear A symbol based on a hieroglyph um, conveying the meaning of a word, but that symbol then looked like the hieratic fraction symbol that was also being used. So they didn't want you know, the, the two to appear on the tablet, otherwise it might appear confusing. So they created um, bespoke fraction symbols as well as using the hieratic symbols. But that to one side, um, there's other fraction symbols that are called symbols that have been believed to be fractions, which are not actually fractions, um, but nonetheless convey a numerical value. So um, there's, a, there's an example here that we're, we'll look at. So this is the best example of a symbol that has been believed to be a fraction symbol, but is not, but nonetheless conveys a numerical value. We saw tablet HT21A earlier, and it recorded accounting information. So why would the rear of that tablet have this sign written across it? It's because, as we have in our books, and we have on the right-hand side here, the scribe wanted to convey that this side was intentionally left blank, i.e. it was empty, i.e its contents were zero. This helps us on the way to decipherment, as we can see here. Egyptian hieroglyph F35 spells the word nefer, meaning zero. It is simplified to linear A symbol L2, with the vertical stem and the top horizontal bar crossing it. The detail at the bottom of the hieroglyph, which would have been too difficult to write in clay and too time consuming for shorthand, has been simplified to another horizontal bar. From knowing the meaning of the symbol in linear A, which can be deduced from the information contained on tablet HT21B and others, we know that linear A symbol L2 represents hieroglyph F35. And there is some further evidence of this too within the corpus. One tablet has linear A symbol L2 recorded against a whole list of items, tablet HT91A, which is shown here. As you and I know from the world of accounting, and non-accountants will know from common sense, it is highly unlikely that a whole number of different items would be recorded at any one time with the same fraction value. It is far more likely that what is listed here was all being recorded as having a zero value. That's right. Counts from stock takes might have a sequence of zeros against the stock listing when those items are not in stock. Uh, absolutely, that would be the, um, the classic example, um, but that, that isn't quite what's happening here. Um, what is being recorded is items that were being received and items that had not been received but that were nonetheless evidently expected to have been. So there were zeros allocated against those items. Um, and for the eagle-eyed, the, the first item on that list had two zeros or two symbols representing zeros, because the first was written very close to the tablet edge. And when the scribe wrote it, the edge evidently crumbled. So he then had to write the symbol again, closer in um, or further in. So that's why there's two zeros um, in that instance. Interesting stuff. For, for us accountants, um, but with zero identified, um, and the symbol representing zero identified, you know, from, from simply from the information that is in the tablets um, and, and a bit of accounting and logic applied. Um, we, we, can, we can look at one more thing, um, which is back on tablet H 
T123A, which we looked at last time. So if you recall this, um, this is considered in chapter two of my book, which can be downloaded um, from the link below this video. But looking at just one line of the values recorded on tablet HT123A, uh, what is row three of the transcription, and looking at the items recorded here, we can see they are as follows. Now, given that we know that the previously believed fraction symbol, um, linear A symbol L2, actually represents zero, so it is in fact being used here to show that there is no fraction value that should be included, we can see that the first two items in row three of the tablet transcription are in the proportion of 16 to four, or four to one. This is very significant because this ratio appears in the DK series of linear B tablets. Um, and given that this ratio appears here as well, um, we can reasonably safely say that the things being recorded as they were in linear B in this ratio are in linear A also rams and wool. And we can see that with a shorthand method. Yes, we can. Um, so let's just look at the symbol representing rams. If we look at the symbol that represents, I say, rams, it is written in a rather cursive manner on this tablet. So we have to look at how it is written elsewhere in the corpus. On tablet HT14, it appears twice written much more precisely, and we can see there more clearly what is going on. The symbol has two arms, on either, one on either side, but they aren't arms actually, and it has a separate detached shape between them. And this symbol in its entirety is actually hieroglyph F155, which has horns, and a box in between those horns. And it's no coincidence that this hieroglyph is the first hieroglyph in the Middle Egyptian word wep, meaning horned cattle. So here on this tablet, the scribe has used the collective noun wep, horned cattle, to record rams, which of course was his prerogative and simply reflects his choice of language. And after all, we have many synonyms in our own language. But we expected rams to be recorded as the ratio between the items on the tablet was four to one, and rams were indeed recorded. And this proves our theory that linear A is Middle Egyptian written in shorthand using hieroglyphs. I think it does, but I notice that there are fraction symbols on the other lines of the tablet that we haven't spoken about. Can you work out those values? And do those lines and the tablet as a whole also demonstrate the ratio of four to one? Um, yes, it does. And uh, that's covered in chapter two of my book, which um, can be downloaded via the link beneath this video. Um, but these are um, bespoke fraction symbols created for use in linear A, and we, we've talked about those earlier. So wool is the second category of item recorded, so the second item in the 4 to 1 ratio. Um, yes it is, um, and as with the linear B tablets that, that show rams and wool, um, the third category that's shown um, is also the deficit, the amount of wool that hasn't been delivered. Um, and as I say, we're, we'll look at that in more detail um, next time in our next next video. I see. But from, but from this um, accounting analysis, essentially, but from this analysis, um, we, can, we can then go on. Um, because, you know, if this four to one ratio appears in linear A, um, and if wool is being collected, 
Um, and then if, say, 100 years later, linear B is recording this 4 to 1 ratio and wall being collected, um, and those tablets are in linear B are from Canossus and these tablets are from Hagia Triada, I mean, there's, there's such a difference in, in space and time between the two, and yet the same thing being recorded. Um, and, and the same the same transactions, the same thing being collected. This, this can only be a tax. This isn't like a local rent being paid to a landlord. Um, this is, or a landowner, this is, this is tax. And it's, yes, while the government has, has changed in terms of who is sitting at the top, um, it was the Egyptians, it, it's later the Greeks, um, Nonetheless, the mechanisms of, of levying a tax on the wealth of the land are, are the same. Um, and, and the calculation of that tax is the same. So rams, I mean, the rams are counted because they're a proxy for the, the wider flock size. And, you know, you have many hundreds of rams, sorry, ewes per ram. Um, and there's one unit of wool for every four rams. So, so knowing this, um, we can go back to the transcription of tablet HT123 just one last time. And, and I mean, even, even more can be eked out of it um, just simply by understanding the, the accounting of, of what is going on here. The four to one ratio in the linear B corpus was rams compared to wool plus the deficit. So the wool amount in that case was the current amount that had been delivered to date and the deficit was the current deficit outstanding at that date, i.e. in both cases the date the tablet was written. Here the wool amount is the amount by reference to the number of rams on the date of the assessment. So the wool amount was the full amount payable also at the date of the assessment, not the current amount at the date the tablet was written. The deficit, however, is still the current deficit at the date the Linear A tablet was written. Now, the highlighted symbols for the totals of the three categories, rams, wool, and deficit, have two symbols the same for categories one and two, rams and wool, but not the third, deficit. The symbol that is missing from the third is, therefore, the date of the assessment, which was noted for the first two items. As we know from our own time, tax is assessed at the end of the year, which is synonymous with the start of the new year, and it is relatively easy to see which hieroglyph is represented here as a result. If you recall last time, I mentioned that the rotation of symbols was a characteristic of ancient shorthand. Here we see that in practice clearly, and the word that this symbol therefore represents is the first hieroglyph in the Egyptian word for New Year's Day, and this was the day on which this tax was assessed. And finally, all three totals have one symbol that is the same. So we can infer that symbol means total. And indeed it does. With this symbol, however, we have to think a bit more laterally as to how Egyptian hieroglyph N14 became linear A symbol L22. This simplification presumably took place because it was easier to write a cross with two intersecting lines rather than a five-pointed star with five lines meeting at the centre. This therefore represents the first hieroglyph in the Egyptian word for grand total. So we have grand totals on New Year's Day in the first two columns for Rams and Wall as the numbers told us we should expect, and we have what is by inference only the current total in the third column, the deficit. Fascinating stuff, and a very interesting logical 
accounting analysis. Thank you very much, Mark. So what's next? Um, well, of course, there isn't any substitute for actually reading the book. Um, and chapter two, as I've said, is available to download uh, in the link beneath this video. Um, I'm also hoping to announce the publication of a second edition of this book in the near future by um, an academic publisher, having been through a peer review process. Um, but beyond that, in the immediate future, uh, I think there's um, probably one more video to come from you and me um, regarding rams, wool, deficits, and the other livestock, it's mostly livestock, that are recorded on the Linear A tablets themselves. I look forward to it. So we shall see you soon. Until next time, thank you for watching.